Hello, everyone. I want to give it just a moment while you guys connect to audio, but welcome. Thank you for joining. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Again, I'm going to give everyone just a second to connect to audio before I kick us off, but welcome. Okay, great, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Brooke Akins, and on behalf of Q1 Productions and Celligence, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. Today's presentation will discuss ensuring compliance for your IVD's performance evaluation. And we're very lucky to have Mr. Joseph Richardson Larby, who's the Regulatory Affairs Expert of Medical Devices at Celligence with us today. And he will cover essential components of a performance evaluation report and how to prepare key technical do doc documentation, excuse me, to demonstrate acceptable benefit risk ratios and compliance to the IVDR's GSPRs applicable to both legacy and new IVD medical devices. Uh, thank you again to Celligence for developing today's content. Please note that a copy of the presentation recording will be sent to all registered attendees upon completion of today's webinar, and we have left a few minutes at the end for Joseph to take your questions. Please feel free to submit your questions and comments at any time during the webinar for him via the Q&A option that is on your toolbar. If anyone is logging in via the phone and would like to submit a question, please feel free to send those directly to me via email to webinars at q1productions.com and we'll ensure they're included. Again, feel free to submit questions and comments at any time. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Celligence's Dylan Mulvihill, who will be kicking things off today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation titled Insurance Com Ensuring Compliance for Your IVD's Performance Evaluation. And leading this presentation will be Celligent's expert, Joseph Richardson Larby, who I will introduce momentarily. And to give you a brief overview of our agenda for today, um, we will start with an introduction to Joseph, like I mentioned, as well as an introduction to Celligent, as well as our service offering. Then we will go into IVD and the history of the regulations, as well as the upcoming timeline. Then we'll move on to the key changes to IVDR from the IVD, as well as the key compliance elements of the IVDR. Then we will go into the, in the intricacies of the performance evaluation report under the new IVDR, as well as finally moving into the industry best practices from Joseph, as well as a Q&A session. So feel free to send in any questions that you would like Joseph to answer at the end of the session. Now, Joseph Richardson Larby is a medical device and IVD regulatory consultant here at Intelligence. He has over 20 years in medical device, life cycle management, and quality management experience, um, with some of his key experiences include, including preparation and maintenance, technical files, product safety and vigilance reporting, clinical evaluations, risk assessments, regulatory audits, as well as others. And just to note, he's worked for small, medium, as well as large size biotech companies, including Roche, OBG Pharmaceuticals, and Kind Consumer. Now, just to give you a brief background about Celligence, um, we were formed in 2017, and we now have offices in Chicago, where our headquarters is located, as well as the UK and Bangalore, India. Now, our goal and our uh, overarching mission it's to improve compliance while also reducing costs while increasing efficiency for the life science industry in the area of regulatory affairs. And a few of our clients, you can see over to the right, um, the, this ranges from small to mid-sized to even major large manufacturers, as you can see, including Novartis, Bausch Health, Johnson & Johnson, among others. Now here is our global presence. As I mentioned, our headquarters is in Chicago, and our offices in Bangalore and you in the Bangalore and India, and as well as the UK. But we also have partner offices in Brazil, China, Japan, and other areas. Um, but if you have any questions about region specific services or questions about a certain region, feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to make that happen. Okay, just to give you a brief overview of some of our service offerings. 
Um, the first pillar here is uh, regulatory consulting, where the other four pillars are more surrounded around operational work, including regulatory writing and labeling. But I did want to mention um, of our IBD services, our IBD gap analysis has been highly requested lately. Um, but we also specialize in performance evaluation plans and reports, scientific validity reports, analytical performance reports, and clinical performance clinical performance reports, as well as performance or post-market performance follow-up plans and reports as well. So we can help you with the full spectrum of IBD compliance activities. And now I'd like to pass things along to our featured presenter, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks for the introduction. And um, it's good to have another, another webinar to um, spread the word and you know share ideas on um, common best practices within within the industry. Yes, um, IVDs. I, there's a lot. There's a lot happening with IVDs at the moment. Um, but let's just have a look at you know the entire IVDs. What are IVDs? You know the history of it, how it's been regulated, um, the timelines, how we've moved from IVDD, the directive, going into a regulation, and the timelines and stuff like that. And we'll discuss a few issues and um, a few updates that are happening around IVDs and um, the regulation. So. Um, what are IVDs? And I won't go into, you know, the full definition of, of what an IVD is. Um, but, you know, Article 2, Section 2 has got the full definition there. It's, it's up on your screen as well, of, um, technically what an IVD is. Um, but we all know um, IVDs are devices that analyze samples away from the body or out of the body. So, you know, if you draw a blood sample and you're going to test it in a laboratory, then, you know, um, um, these devices, um, software, control solutions, calibrators are all classified as um, IVD, so in vitro diagnostic medical devices. Um, in terms of the history of um, how medical devices have been regulated to date, um, so there was the old approach, um, especially in, in Europe, uh, so this was pre-1990s, um, okay? And then the European Commission or Council decided to come up with a new approach of um, directives. This is where we saw the um, medical device directive coming out, the um, active implantable medical device directive also coming out, and then, you know, the in vitro di um, diagnostic directive also coming out and um, on the screen here you can see the key dates when they were released so the active implantable um, directive was at first that was released um, under the new approach of regulating medical devices um, as early as 1990 okay so these um, directives have been uh, have been around for some time and then the medical device directives came about in 1993. So you can see in June 1993. And then the IVDs, funny enough, was, was the last one to be, um, to be released. And that was released in 1998. Um, so these three devices formed the new approach of um, regulating medical devices within, within the European region. And it was only until 1998 that, you know, um, the European Commission sort of like put its foot down to say, look, everybody has to follow the directives, take the directives, transpose it into your um, local, local law. Um, so, you know, since 1998, the IVDs have been in place and, um, we all know what, what's happened within the medical devices space, you know, in terms of um, metal on metal hip implants, um, using industrial grade silicone for breast implants and, you know, the issues that it's caused to some patients and, you know, the um, so-called dodgy notified bodies that were out there not really doing things as they should. Um, manufacturers also not um, keeping good records and, you know, so on and so forth, um, which all went into sort of like a spiral effect and um, 
caused the European Commission to really look into how medical devices are being regulated and decided to publish a new set of um, regulations. So the difference is, you know, directives, which were, uh, you could pick and choose certain elements and then make it into a, a national law uh, or a statutory instrument for the UK, as we say, um, to a regulation where the regulation, the difference is for a regulation, you have to straight away it's it's the law you have to adapt take it adapt and implement straight away um, so that's where we find ourselves at the moment the medical devices has actually um, applied its um, regulation so that was in, on the 26th of may 2021 and for the ivds we are looking at the 26th of may 2022 um, so that's that's basically the timeline shown um, on your screen here, um, where we've come since 2017. So the IVDs or directive of the IVD was used from 1998 all the way to um, 2017, or will be used all the way to 2022. Um, so it's got a good what. 22, 24 years of, of use. And, you know, it's, it's fair to say um, it's about time that we revamp these um, directives and go into um, something else that will match um, the current technology and, you know, what's happening in the medical device industry, because a lot happens and changes within the industry, you know. Um, so, yes, that's the timeline that you see on the screen there. Um, so let's move on to key changes to the IVDR from the IVD, okay. So, um, so there is a implementation period, um, the date of application for the IVDR is the 26th of May 2022. Um, however, we all know, or I don't know if you are aware, but about a month ago, the um, European Commission submitted to the Parliament and the Council a proposal to postpone the date of application for the IVDR. Um, it is planned that if this is accepted, the um, transitional period for certain devices is going to change, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll come to the um, periods in a bit, but um, that's one thing that's happening within, within the industry, all right? Um, looking at key changes that are changing between the IVD directive going into a regulation, you have a shift in regulatory scrutiny, okay? Um, the notified bodies are all being reassessed. So under the directive you had 19 20 um, notified bodies um, at the moment as we speak we've only got six notified bodies um, designated according to the um, regulation which is part of the reason why you know um, the european commission is seeking a an extension to the date of application looking at what's happening with covid and you know in the middle of this pandemic and what you need is you know, groundbreaking technology of the all these IVD devices, sort of like doing their bit to really bring down the uh, mortality rates. Um, the IVD directive was basically list based when it comes to classification, which is one big thing that's changing under the regulations where, uh, you know, the directive was list A, list B. Um, but now the regulation is now going into a, a rule-based classification. So class A, class B, class C, class D, um, from lowest to highest in that order, A to D. And when it comes to devices that will be, uh, will come under the um, oversight of a notified body. So what you can self-certify and what you cannot self-certify, there's a big shift there, you know. Um, under the directive, about 10 to 15% were under a notified body's oversight that needed, you know, certification. Uh, the majority of IVDs under the directives were self-certified. 
Okay, so you had a good 85% of all IVDs being, being self-certified. Whereas now it's flipped the other way around. A good 85 to 90% will fall under the <laughs> responsibility of a notified body. Um, so one, it's not that we've, we've only got um, fewer notified bodies um, designated to the new regulation. But now you go, you've got an increase in um, products that are actually going to the notified bodies as well. And that's, that, that is a tough one, you know. So um, I, personally, I think it's probably a good call um, considering COVID and everything and having to or wanting to uh, postpone the date of application. Because the last thing that anybody wants is a shortage of um, devices um, on the market. And that's likely to happen if, if you've only got very few notified bodies. The notified bodies will be a huge, huge bottleneck to all the manufacturers out there that want the um, devices certified. And if you can't get this, um, devices to the market, then it means devices are not available um, for individuals to use. And then, yeah, um, we'll find ourselves in, in some real danger there. So um, that's, that's the whole reasoning behind wanting to postpone the um, date of application for um, the regulation. And really what, what that would do is they're going to stretch out the um, transition period for the um, devices. So um, class D um, um, devices will be extended until 2025. So that's an additional one year for a high risk um, class because currently that's May, 2024. Um, for a class C, that will be to May, 2026. So that class Cs will have a two year um, extended, extended period. Um, your class Bs and class As will be extended to 2027. So they will then have a three year gap Okay, um, three year um, transitional period after it's been implemented. So um, the proposal has just been submitted to the parliament and the council. Um, we wait to see what, what's going to happen there. So um, keep your eyes um, on the screens or you know, watch out for your news feeds um, to be up, up to date on that one, to be updated on that one. So now that we've discussed the background, let's quickly go into key compliance elements of the IVDR, which also entails the you know, performance evaluation reports. And then we'll go into performance evaluation reports, have a look at some best practices, um, the best way to draft your performance evaluation reports, and, and so on and so forth. So um, stay with me. Okay. Right, um, so key compliance um, elements of the IVDR. So uh, the classification, like I mentioned, is, is key um, to the IVDR. So the first thing is to reassess, you know, where your devices falls from, you know, a self-certified um, IVD under the directive, and it might fall into a class A or a class B, or some of them could jump all the way from self-certified to a class D. So um, nothing is impossible here. So just go through the um, classification rules, um, Article 47 or Annex 8 of the IVDR and make sure that your classification is right. Um, have a look at the obligations for manufacturers. And um, that's in Article 10 of the IVDR. And bear in mind that the IVDR is a life cycle approach. Okay, so continuous compliance. It doesn't stop after you've submitted your technical file and got your CE mark or approval for your IVDs. Um, you have to continue to monitor its performance, um, submit reports to the competent authorities or to the notified bodies, um, depending on your classification and the reports that you need to um, submit. But there's a PSUR, a PMS report, um, a performance evaluation, um, post-market performance follow-up um, reports. So all of these things. So um, just bear in mind um, that it is a continuous compliance um, journey that we're on, and not just a one-time one-time thing. 
um, for your device identification and registration. So now you've got um, UDIs and UDAMID, which is now active. So now actors or manufacturers, distributors can register themselves in um, UDAMID and you can actually start registering um, devices as well. So that's a new one that came about um, about four or five weeks ago. So the second module, this, or, or say second and third module of UDAMED is now open. So um, if you're not familiar with that, have a look at the EC's website and um, familiarize yourself with it and start registering your devices accordingly. And then we've got clinical evidence. Okay, so clinical evidence, it's, it's, it will all come about from your performance evaluations and your performance studies. So make sure that um, as you go through this webinar at the end of it, you know, hopefully you will learn a few, a few things um, that you can implement and um, make sure you submit good clinical evidence for your IVDs. And the last point that I want to touch on is notified bodies. So like I mentioned, we've only got six notified bodies compared to 19 under the IVDR. So that tells you the tight squeeze um, for notified bodies at the moment. And I've listed the six that have been designated to the IVDR on the screen here. You can also find this list on the EC Nando website. So EC N A N D O website. Um, conformity assessment routes. So the um, conformity assessment routes under the IVDR. I've just put a diagram on the screen here so you know which routes you're going to use uh, for your class A's, which are going to be self certified. So that's, you know, you submit, you have to prepare your technical documentation um, according to Annex 2 and Annex 3 of the IVDR. And then you can affix yourself a CE mark um, on the device or its packaging. Um, for certain class A's that are sterile, um, class B, C's and D's, then you've also got their routes um, to um, certification as well. And you can see the difference in the CE marks there, where for sterile class A's, um, class B, C and D IVDs, you do have the notified body identification number underneath the CE mark. So just bear that in mind. And also for class D's, you will need an expert consultation as well as it's stated in Article 48 of the IVDR. So um, do have a look at those and make sure that you are complying as well. Okay, so on to today's um, topic. So I hope the overview was you know, quite clear and we are up to date with what's happening in the IVD industry. Let's now move on to performance evaluation reports of an IVD. Okay, so what standards or guidance um, documents do we need to draft a, a good uh, performance evaluation report? So um, have a look at these particular um, standards or guidance, guidance documents. Um, you've got Annex 56 and Annex 13 of the um, IVDR. You've got Annex 1 of the IVDR. So basically, Article 56 points you to certain elements of um, Annex 1. Um, that's the GSPR, so the General Safety and Performance Requirements of the um, IVDR. That's very important. Um, you've got guidance documents provided by the Global Harmonization Task Force, which is now the IMDRF, so International Medical Device um, uh, Regulators Forum. Um, they actually took over from the GHTFs, so Global Harmonization Task Force. Um, however, these particular documents for IVDs were not transposed into IMDRFs. Um, why? I don't know, but that's that's the status quo. So, you know, there is the um, N6, N7, N8 of these particular documents that you see on the screen. Um, 
have a look at those as well. I think N6 is just um, definitions, N7 goes into, into depth, um, telling you the things that you need to consider for the elements of your performance evaluation report. And N8 goes into um, clinical performance studies. Um, so if you have to carry out a clinical performance study, then you know the, the standards and practices that you need to follow. So that's that, but that will be out of scope of today's webinar. And then we have our good old friend, the MedDev um, 271 revision four. Um, that's solely for medical devices, but also applies to IVDs because you know an IVD is technically still a medical device. So um, there are things that we can draw um, parallels from. And then we've got the MDCG Medical Device Commissioning Group 2020-1. Um, um, that's for performance evaluation reports for medical device software. Um, that's, that's the only one that comes close from the MDCGs um, for softwares. There are stuff about um, post-market clinical follow-ups and you know stuff like that, but when it comes to specifically for the IVDs, there isn't much under the um, MDCGs for IVDs, unless you've got something solely related to COVID-19. And then in that case, there are a lot of guidance documents under the MDCGs for um, um, devices and performance evaluations for um, devices that are testing for COVID-19 related stuff. Okay. So um, looking at a few definitions. So, you know, we've got the performance evaluation that's on the screen. Um, really there are three elements of a uh, performance evaluation and that is the scientific validity of the analytes that you are um, analyzing, the analytical performance and your clinical performance. Okay, so these are the three main pillars of a um, performance evaluation. So a performance evaluation is an assessment and analysis of data to establish or verify the scientific validity, the analytical, and where applicable, the clinical performance of a device. And we'll come into each one later, and then um, we'll discuss how they are supposed to um, be drafted in the report. So for your scientific validity of an analyte, this is basically the association of an analyte with a clinical condition. So how can you prove that um, testing a blood sample can give you results for a particular clinical condition? For example, um, if we take um, uh, people with diabetes, then you know they could test blood samples to test blood glucose, but what is to show that testing blood glucose will uh, give you the analysis of, you know, um, how high or low they are in um, blood sugar or HbA1c, for example. Um, so that is your, um, your scientific validity. And then your analytical performance is um, the performance of the device itself to actually detect the analyte that you, are, you intend to measure. And once you've got that, then you've got your clinical performance. How do these test results relate or correlate with a particular um, clinical condition. Okay, so these are the three main uh, umbrellas of a performance evaluation. Now, these three pillars are then wrapped into a few other things. So you can wrap these three as one bundle and you can wrap them up with state of the art. So all these things that you're doing, you're supposed to compare it with state of the art. In, in medicine of that particular field that you're in. You to analyze your risk elements. Um, what's your benefit risk ratio of your device when used as intended by the manufacturer? So that's one thing. And how does it demonstrate compliance to the GSPRs? So that's another thing. So these things, when you wrap them all one, this is your performance evaluation report. And hopefully we can go through these slides very quickly and um, gather a few golden nuggets along the way. So like I mentioned, the concept and the process as I, as I described, so you have got 
um, your clinical performance, scientific validity, um, analytical performance as your big circle. And you know, you have to work with the state of the art. Um, when you draw in data, you must draw data from your post market surveillance system. You must also draw data from your post market performance follow up that feeds into into your um, PER as well. And with all these things, you must consider your uh, risk management approach as well. And you should work to the um, recent ISO standards in risk management, ISO 14971, um, specifically 2019. That's the latest standard that's out there at the moment. So this is just a graphical view, just to demonstrate how a performance evaluation report is put together. Okay, now let's go into the structure. What should be in your report of a, of a PER? Now, um, when I'm drafting these um, PERs, I'll start with a device description. And it's, it's very important to lay out what the device is about. What is it doing? What, it, what are the manufacturer's intentions for um, the device? So the reader can understand um, the device before it goes into the scientific validity and the analytical performance and the clinical performance. It makes it easier for the reader or the notified body to understand your report if you report it this way. So um, structure your report in a way that's easily understood by the reader. So that's, that's what I've, I've, I've just mentioned. And I'll start with your device description. And now going to the intended use and the purpose of the of the device, um, you you will be surprised the number of um, sort of like reports that I review, and it's not clear, it's, or it hasn't been stated clearly what the intended use is, and this is under the um, IVDD, you know. Um, not that the IVDD didn't specify for intended use, but there, there is, from what I've seen, there are certain practices that certain manufacturers um, have adopted and it has gone unnoticed. And they don't clearly state what the intended use or the intended purpose is from, from certain literature that I review, um, which, is, which is not right. So always make sure you state clearly what the intended use or the intended purpose is the um, targeted population that the device is supposed to be using, whether it's um, pediatrics, um, adults, if you specify a particular age, uh, make sure that you state those. Um, if it's for a particular stage in a clinical condition, then you know, make sure that you do, you do state the stage of that particular clinical condition as well. Um, if it's in the early stages or the advanced stages, make sure you do state all of this. Um, who the intended user is. Um, is it for the actual patient? Is this for the healthcare professional? Um, make sure all of these things are stated. Um, the use environment or the location for testing. Um, is it in the laboratory? Is it at home? Um, in the hospital by the bedside? Make sure all of these things are stated. Um, your risk classification, like we mentioned, you know, the new classes um, under the uh, performance evaluation. So you go your class A, B, C, D, make sure you state clearly what the classification of the device is and the rationale behind the classification. So um, a, a key thing that the notified bodies under the um, new regulations want to see, especially when it comes to the um, classification is not just saying it's, you know, rule number four under, under the IVDR and, and this is it. No, they want to see you demonstrating how you came to that risk classification. So they want to see you analyzing all applicable rules of the um, IVDR and why you decide to um, select the particular one that you've ended up with. So um, make sure that your risk classification is expanded to um, demonstrate that all applicable um, rules have been considered, okay? And then we come into device characteristics. Um, your claimed performance, um, what performance are you claiming for your device? Make sure that is clearly stated um, in the uh, performance evaluation report. Um, your performance parameters or specification, whether it's 
diagnostic sensitivity or specificity. Uh, make sure you do state these things clearly. Um, diagnostic sensitivity is to um, detect that um, an analyte has is testing positive to a particular condition. Uh, specificity is, is the opposite of that. So make sure that all of these things are stated clearly within your performance evaluation report. Um, so still under device description, make sure you describe the analyte or the marker that you are analyzing, the technology involved in the device, uh, make sure you do elaborate on that. Um, any limitations of your device and contraindications, things that the device should not be used for, um, all of these things, I state them under the device description, okay? And your stability parameters. So the claimed shelf life, um, in-use stability, um, shipping stability, temperature controls, um, storage, all of these things, make sure that you state these clearly. Um, by the time you've listed all of these things in the report to a very robust level, um, it makes it easier for the notified body by the time they get into um, the actual clinical evidence or the clinical data that they are about to review. And it, it gives them also a good impression of the manufacturer and they know that they're off to a good start and they'll be in a good mood and they'll be able to review and provide some you know, good feedback. Right, um, so under, under for, for, for your PER, uh, performance evaluation reports, like I mentioned, the three main umbrellas is your scientific validity, your analytical performance and your clinical performance, okay? Um, the PER is to analyze your clinical evidence, okay? And the clinical evidence is really the three things that I've just mentioned, your scientific validity, your analytical performance, and your clinical performance. And you want to demonstrate that the clinical evidence that you are gathering, the data that you are gathering from these three parameters has clinical benefits, okay? So your device is going to improve a patient's life or to uh, make the work of a healthcare professional easier. So your clinical performance. So you have to demonstrate that these three parameters have clinical, clinical benefits, sorry, clinical benefits, not clinical performance, um, clinical benefits. And it demonstrates compliance to the relevant GSPRs. And we'll come into the GSPRs and which ones that you need to use and, and you know, demonstrate compliance to later on. Um, in addition to this, the device must have an acceptable benefit risk ratio. So you must also demonstrate that your device, when used in the environment as intended by the uh, manufacturer, and if you follow the instructions as per the um, in instru uh, manufacturer's instructions, will have an acceptable benefit risk ratio. So the benefits of using the um, device must outweigh any risks, any harm to the patient, um, and you must be able to demonstrate this in your PER. So um, when you are considering all of this data, like I said, you can wrap up all of these things, and you must consider data from your post-market surveillance and your post-market performance um, follow-up as per your um, PMS plan. And I've got a diagram here to show you how things come together under your performance system. I won't go too much into this. So you've got your uh, post-market surveillance system that should have a post-market surveillance plan. And through this, you can have your post-market reports or your PSURs. And you see how they integrate with other systems. Your risk management integrates with Udemed when you have to submit some of these reports. Your SSCPs need to go into um, Udemed, for example. Um, you've got you know, sales figures, usage data that needs to be part of your PSURs. Um, your PSURs must have an element of your PM, PMPFs. So this diagram is trying to address both medical devices and IVDs. Um, cuppers and changes are also outputs from your PSURs and so on and so forth. So this is just a 
snapshot to demonstrate how your post-market surveillance system works. And um, I've done a previous webinar on post-market surveillance system for medical devices. So um, check out the link in uh, on that, on Celligence's website. Um, go under webinars and you'll be able to find um, the one up for post-market surveillance that goes into um, death in certain elements of these reports. So for your um, performance evaluation report, what PMS data are you supposed to identify and include in your performance evaluation report? Um, I'll, I'll put a table together here and you know i've listed the classifications on the left so a to d and basically which type of reports that you can you can you can basically um, base data on and use in your performance evaluation report so you take a um, class c for example then that's your um, psurs um, adverse events reports um, serious incidents and field safety corrective actions um, data from there you know add those to your performance evaluation reports, um, demonstrate your, your risk and your benefit risk, uh, your benefit risk ratio um, for those. Um, so that's, that's very important that you include um, post-market surveillance data. Obviously, if it's a device that's now going to market, you will not have that, but um, just make sure that you include um, any relevant PMS data in your report. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we come to um, the criteria for clinical evidence. So what is clinical evidence? Clinical evidence is the data that you get from analyzing the three pillars under a performance evaluation report. So your scientific validity, your analytical performance, and your clinical performance. Now, clinical performance, the third element, is not always expected, or it's not always needed. Um, especially for um, class class A um, IVDs, um, the IVDR makes it clear that um, um, clinical performance is not expected for those. It doesn't mean you cannot produce it. You can produce it, but it's not expected. So um, if your clinical performance um, element is missing from your PER for a class A IVD, um, yes, that, that, will be, that will be okay. Um, but that also depends on three other um, parameters, okay? In order to determine whether you need your clinical performance or not, you have to determine whether your technology or device is established and standardized. Is it an established and standardized test? Or is it an established and non-standardized test? or is it a novel, um, novel test, so new technology coming up? Obviously, if it's a new technology coming up, then you, know, you have to demonstrate um, clinical evidence, video, scientific validity, analytical performance, and clinical performance. So I've put this table together, which is self-explanatory, that tells you um, what you will need depending on which group that you fall into. And to go into that, we've got, you know, the established and standardized tests means tests that have been, that have clinical guidelines or consensus for the use of the test. So that means it's, it's established and it's a standardized test. Um, there is more than one commercial test available. So the technology and the test is out there, probably approved, already approved. That's out there that people are using. Um, so that means it's established, it's out there and all international standards or reference materials exist. So, you know, um, there's an international standard for that particular test. If you take um, devices for um, that test for diabetes or blood glucose meters, there is the ISO 151997 as, a, as an ISO standard, which is an international standard that's already out there. So if you are coming out with technology that's um, going to be testing to uh, or, or testing for blood glucose and the, of a particular technology and you're going to be using ISO 15197, then immediately it's established, it's a standardized test. And in that case, your scientific validity plus your analytical performance clinical data will equal your clinical evidence. 
So in that case, as long as you can demonstrate competitors and state of the art, demonstrate your benefit risk ratios, then in that case, you don't need to demonstrate clinical performance. And clinical performance, just a sort of recap, is to demonstrate that your test results correlate to the actual clinical condition. So that is what your clinical performance is doing. Okay. Um, so these are these are some of the parameters under an established and standardized test. And we've got the same thing for established and non-standardized tests. So you know you can have clinical guidelines. Um, there could be more than one commercial test available, but while international standard reference materials may exist. Performance obtained from different IVD medical devices might not be used interchangeably. So uh, there might be something um, different between one manufacturer and the other and, this, and the type of test and technology that they've got. You cannot interchange these things. In that case, it's a non-standardized test. So you have to look into those and there are examples listed on the screen here. So um, do look into, into these um, elements. And if you're a novel test, it means new technology, new target population, new application of an established technology or a new intended use um, because you're going into a different uh, therapeutic area or different intended use, then it will be classed as a novel test. In that case, you have to demonstrate um, that your clinical performance is, is um, up to standard. So in that case, you have to demonstrate that your clinical um, evidence includes your clinical performance. So now let's go into scientific validity. So like we said, scientific validity is the association of an analyte to a clinical condition or physiological state. Um, things that you need to consider um, under your scientific validity report. So your, I mean, you can break your performance evaluation report into sections, and then you have your section for scientific validity, which will be part of it. Uh, when you read your guidance documents, so the GHTFs, it says your scientific validity um, data must be in a scientific validity report. Um, the same thing for analytical performance and the same thing for clinical performance. Um, it doesn't mean that there must be three separate documents. You can have them in sections and all in one particular performance evaluation report. That's the approach that I would use as long as you uh, there's a good table of contents and, you know, you can lay out everything properly. Um, it's easy to follow. Um, you've got links, you've got uh, pictures and diagrams. It, it all adds up. Okay. So for your scientific validity, things that you should consider, what disease or condition is the IVD testing for? Make sure you clearly state what you are intending to test for whether it's COVID, whether it's diabetes, or, you know, whatever it is, make sure you state that clearly. Um, what analyte is a device trying to detect or, or measure? Um, it goes without saying, because that's what scientific validity is about. Um, what is the proof of concept? Um, is the scientific validity well-established? If it is, how is it well established? Make sure you state all of these things. Um, what method are you going to use to demonstrate scientific validity of the analyte? Um, are you going to review um, competitors' products and predicate IFUs, the literature that's out there to draw similarity and comparisons? Are you going to carry out a scientific literature review or are you going to conduct clinical performance studies um, to get your scientific validity results to demonstrate that the particular analyte is rightfully um, associated to the um, clinical condition that you, you're trying to measure. So, you know, is, is, is a urine sample uh, the best um, method to detect, I don't know, diabetes, for example, or you, is a blood sample testing for glucose the best um, association with, you know, diabetes, um, then you have to state all of these things. And then we go into um, analytical performance. So analytical performance is the ability and accuracy of the device to detect the analyte. So now that you've drawn your association of the analyte to the um, clinical condition, How accurate is the medical device in, in, in picking up the particular analyte? 
So you have to demonstrate this. So there might be standards that you have to test to. Um, for example, if it's a blood glucose meter, then you've got the ISO 15197 that tells you the test and the parameters that you have to test for. Um, you have to go through those to demonstrate that will be your analytical performance, okay? So what is the main analytical performance characteristic? Analytical sensitivity, trueness, precision, etc. Make sure you state those and you state it clearly. Um, how and by what method is clinical performance proven? So this is what I was saying. Are you going to use um, comparison with reference materials, uh, testing or verification to um, harmonize standards? And uh, I gave the example of 151971 for blood glucose meters. Um, comparison with predicate devices, or you're going to conduct a clinical performance study. Um, if you are going to conduct a clinical performance study, then uh, one four, ISO 14155 uh, for clinical trials and practices and notifications to competent authorities, um, the FDA, um, whoever, you have to follow all those right processes, okay? Um, does the use of the IVD depend on calibrators? and or um, control materials. If it does, you state it. Uh, what metrological standard is the cal um, calibrator or control material calibrated or traceable to? So it must be traceable to national standards as well if you're going to use all of these things. So um, they must have you know, uncertainty, measurements of uncertainty as well. Make sure all of these things are stated in there um, to demonstrate your analytical performance. And now we're coming to clinical performance. If it is needed, based on what we've already discussed, um, class A's or, you know, uh, novel tests, or if they established and standardized test, you know, that then tells you whether you need to demonstrate clinical performance or not. Um, if you're going to do that, make sure you state all of these things um, properly. Um, first of all, is clinical performance data required for the technology or device of the analyte that you are evaluating? Make sure you state those. Um, how and by what method will clinical performance be demonstrated? So are you going to carry out a full blown out clinical performance study? Um, you're going to review scientific literature, uh, scientific opinions, or you know, routine diagnostic testing, all of these parameters, make sure that whatever route that you use, you demonstrate how you are um, the method and you know the clinical data that comes with that particular method, make sure you detail it extensively in your performance evaluation report. Um, so you know, I mentioned that you can wrap all of these things up into a state of the art. Um, so uh, state of the art, like we know, it's not clearly defined in um, the IVDR or you know, the met there is it per se, you know, although they mention state of the art, but they don't really tell you exactly how um, state of the art, how you are to measure state of the art. Um, state of the art with what I consider state of the art, I take a geographical area that I'm working to. Um, I have a look at the devices that are there. Um, what is the standard practice in that, in that um, geographical area? And then I benchmark myself or the device to what is done in that particular geographical area. Um, that is a way to demonstrate state of the art because that's what's currently happening within that geographical area. So if, if it's within Europe and how do you test for um, uh, blood glucose in in within Europe. So you have a look at the market and what's going on and um, key competitors within a particular therapeutic area or um, clinical condition, and you draw your similarities to it. You consider the benefits, you consider the technology, um, you consider the risks of um, competitor re um, reports, um, competitor devices, and you draw conclusions or parallels to um, comparisons to, to what's happening on the market. And this is how I prove state of the art. So um, state of the art in medicine is to determine what the clinical practice or standard of care is in a particular geographical area with regards to a particular IVD diagnostic assay and to determine how the IVD under evaluation performs against such SOTA standards in that particular clinical practice or standard of care. So that's everything that I've just, I've just explained. What is the geographical area? 
um, what is the clinical practice, the standard of care. Um, you can say, what are the top five? What are the top 10 devices? And the rationale behind getting the top 10 or top five devices is when you take the top five, top 10 devices, for example, you can demonstrate that these top five or these top 10 devices are a particular percentage of the market share. So then you can draw comparisons to that market share. So if these devices hold 80% of the market share, and this is what they are doing in this particular clinical condition, um, therapeutic area, then drawing your um, comparison to this is state of the art, okay? That's how I would go about it, state of the art. That's one way to demonstrate state of the art. Um, how and by which method will state of the art in medicine be determined? Um, are you going to um, review the IFUs of um, competitors' products, um, scientific literature searches, or are you going to go through um, health authority um, database um, for your market surveillance reports? Um, so, you know, in the US, you've got the TPLCs, you've got the FDA mode, um, or, you know, in the UK, you've got the MHRA's um, website that you can go to and pull up reports. Um, you can have a look at, you know, all these um, post-market surveillance reports that have been submitted to competent authorities. And then you'll be able to then draw um, comparisons to these um, devices. Um, for your scientific literature search, um, so, you know, for any of these parameters, yes, you can have, um, you can conduct scientific literature searches or reviews. Um, if you are going to do those, then, you know, you need a good tool um, that will assist you in carrying out your science, uh, scientific um, literature search. Um, good reporting, you must be able to report and report it effectively. And I'll, I'll come to those uh, things in a bit. Um, but, you know, for, for a good tool to demonstrate that you've carried out your um, scientific literature search, you know, um, at Celligence, we've, we've got a groundbreaking technology that we're using at the moment called CAPTIS. And that saves us up, up, up until up about 20% of our writer's time. Um, so you can get in touch with Celligence, for example, to um, demonstrate this new platform um, that we've got. And there's a 30 day free trial. So, you know, it's, it's free, you've got nothing to lose. Um, go on to Sally Jensen's website, look for the Captis logo and, uh, you know, get in touch with us to arrange for a free demonstration. And we will demonstrate how this new technology can save you time in carrying out a scientific literature um, review of your medical devices, irrespective of the therapeutic area. Um, but for your reports, you have to make sure that you detail things properly under your scientific um, literature search re review. Um, the name of the device, the model, you know, scope of the of the of, of the search that you are conducting, the period that you are covering, make it clear the period that you're covering, whether it's five years, six years, ten years, um, you know, two years, whatever. Make sure you um, state those periods properly and clearly. Um, the literature sources or the databases that you're using, Google Scholar and the rest, make sure you, you state it clearly. Um, the database search details, so you know the search terms, the keywords that you're using, um, the selection criteria used to um, that you're using to select and choose your articles, make sure you state those clearly. Um, the output of your report, conclusions, uh, you know, suitability, or, you know, how did you include certain articles? How did you exclude certain articles? You know, the criteria and, you know, your search terms and everything, make sure everything is detailed properly in your report. So the notified body, when they're looking at your scientific literature um, search report, they can say, yes, you've considered all the keywords, the key terms you've looked into, you've used the right databases, your inclusion and exclusion criteria is X, Y, Z. You've stated everything clearly. And like I mentioned, our platform Captis will, will give you ways that you've never worked before. It can finalize reports that you can easily drop into your final your final Word document or PDF um, straight away, and it will format everything in a table for you. So it makes it easier when you're using this. So you know, do do get in touch with um, Intelligence for a free demonstration on this. 
And um, coming up to our final slides, you have to demonstrate your benefit risk ratio and then compliance to your GSPRs, okay? Um, so these are specific requirements of the IVDR. You have to state clearly what the intended clinical benefit is. So what is the benefit to the user? State it clearly. Um, identify the relevant GSPRs, and I've stated here at least GSPR 1 um, to 9.4. Um, you have to, if they are applicable for your particular device, make sure you state those and you state it clearly with clinical evidence, um, clinical data that is relevant. And you have to make sure that it's um, objectively right. Make sure that you, I mean, there are no two ways about it. You have to make sure that you are demonstrating compliance to the GSPRs. Um, so go through those and make sure that you've got the clinical data to demonstrate compliance to these. Um, analyze all risk associated with the use of the device. And I've, I've put all in capital letters here. So you have to make sure that all risk associated with the use of the device has been evaluated. Okay, evaluate all your risk measures. Make sure that you follow the um, ISO 141971 um, standard, the latest of it, 2019. And you make sure that all risks, harm parameters, um, severity, everything is recorded, um, your controls um, before and after, and you know you analyze that risk um, or, or your harm. Make sure you detail it properly. Um, and then the final point to draw your uh, benefit risk ratio, use your either um, qualitative or quantitative methods to demonstrate the benefit risk ratio. If you're using a scoring system, make it clear what your criteria is, how you are scoring, and then come up with your, with your scoring to prove that you know, the benefit outweighs the risk. If you go in um, qualitatively, then you know, make sure that you state that clearly as well for the um, user. And then coming to the conclusions of your uh, performance evaluation report, First of all, state the intended use, justify the approach that you've used to demonstrate clinical evidence. And for the clinical evidence, we're talking about your three parameters mainly, uh, your scientific validity of the analytes, your analytical performance, and then your clinical performance. Make sure for each of those, you state clearly what your approach is, um, how you are demonstrating your clinical evidence. Um, how the data evaluated is sufficient and of significant quality. So if you have to score it, you have to weight it, um, make sure you state all of these things properly. And you know the principles of um, MedDev 271 do apply here. So your stage is zero to stage four. You know, you have to plan it properly, you have to identify, you analyze, you you um, appraise, you appraise, and then you analyze your data, and then you draft the report. It goes without saying, you have to make sure that these are done and done properly. Otherwise, the notified bodies will pull you up on it. State why the device is safe and effective to use and how the clinical benefits outweigh any risk posed to users of the device. Bearing in mind, state of the art, um, make sure that you demonstrate that the clinical benefits that a patient or healthcare professional will get, the user will get from the device outweighs any risk posed. So make it clear um, your indications of, you know, your risk elements and your uh, benefit risk ratios and draw proper conclusions to it. And then finally, you have to add on any actions or observations that require further investigation via other systems. So such as your risk management file system, your CAPA system, you have to state all of those and then put your quality management system to good use, demonstrate that you are using an effective quality uh, management system where you know there'll be outputs from your performance evaluation um, when you've analyzed, maybe when you're going through your um, benefit risk data, there'll be certain elements that you might find that you need extra data to demonstrate that the device is safe, or you might have to put certain things through a post-market performance follow-up 
um, make sure you state those clearly on what the outputs are and the actions that you intend to take. Um, use, use your um, copper system effectively here, record it under your copper system, give it a reasonable timeline of which you're going to um, close these coppers just to demonstrate compliance to the notified body or competent authority. And um, yeah, just make sure that you follow these principles um, amongst others as well. Um, so, so that's so that's mainly you know um, the key elements that you can consider when you draft in a performance evaluation report. Um, let's have a look at some of the industry's um, best practices. Um, so, like I mentioned, planning the med depth stages do come in, you know, steps zero to four or stages zero to four. Make sure you follow these things. You plan and you plan it properly. This is why the IVDR is asking for um, a, a performance evaluation plan um, report. So you have to state clearly how you intend to identify the relevant data, um, how you're going to analyze and appraise your data and the relevance to the entire objective of a performance evaluation. Um, make sure that your scientific literature report has been documented properly and clearly. Um, the PER itself, make sure that you make it very clear with your device description, um, the intended use, the contraindications, intended user, the technology, everything, make sure that you detail it clearly with a good um, table of contents where you need to use diagrams, use it to explain um, the way your device works, the technology therapeutic area, you know, information about your therapeutic area, make sure you state all of those clearly. Um, and with your conclusions, make it clear what your conclusions are, make it easy for the user, how you've come about to prove um, compliance to the relevant GSPRs, have a good table of the GSPRs, state that it is applicable. Um, if you're going to use other documents or data to demonstrate compliance, make sure you state it clearly what the file name is. Um, if your auditor or the notified body is asking for um, the evidence, it's, clear, it's clearly and readily available. Okay, all of these things add up and make up the whole best practices within, within the industry. Um, your risk management, post-market surveillance and PMPF, all the justification of it. So if you determine that you don't need um, to carry out a post-market performance follow-up, then you have to state the you have to state clearly um, why the reasons why you think so, and you should make sure that it's a very good reason um, because um, it won't fly otherwise. Um, the notified bodies are expecting um, post-market performance follow-ups. Um, I think the only exception is probably the legacy devices that have been out there and they are well established. And even that, there must be the clinical data um, to a very good level to, to use that as a justification that you don't need a um, post-market performance follow-up um, report. So state all of these things clearly. And um, if you do need um, assistance or help with your uh, performance evaluation report, then um, please reach out to Celligence and um, we'll be able to um, assist you accordingly. So um, this webinar, uh, this is my presentation of um, PERs and you know how to um, draft a compliant PER. Um, I will pass it over to my colleague um, that will take the um, Q&A. So I'm here to take your um, questions and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you. So um, thank you very much for joining today's webinar. Thank you so much to Joseph Richardson Larvey, again, regulatory affairs expert, medical devices at Celligence, who I'm going to welcome to turn on his camera. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that excellent presentation. We certainly appreciate okay. all of your insights. Uh, let's jump right into the questions that we have here in the queue. Thank you so much to everybody for uh, submitting your questions. Yeah. Joseph, first question for you. 
what are the similarities or how does a performance evaluation differ from a clinical evaluation of a medical device? Right, um, performance evaluation, clinical evaluation. So um, clinical evaluations are for uh, medical devices under um, the MDR, PRs for um, IVDs under the um, IVDR. Um, I guess the similarities are they are both trying to demonstrate that the uh, clinical data is sufficient and compliant um, using the clinical data to really demonstrate that um, they do meet the um, GSPRs, um, they've got good benefit risk ratios, and um, the clinical benefits are there um, when used as intended by the manufacturer. Um, so I guess those are the similarities. Um, when it comes to differences, really, um, the PER has got more specific elements um, of its clinical evidence. So you're talking about the scientific validity, the analytical performance and the clinical performance. These are quite specific to IVDs and you don't usually get this kind of detail with um, clinical evaluation reports or with medical devices. With medical devices, it's you know your intended user, uh, the benefits, uh, demonstrate the clinical data or clinical performance of your um, medical device and you know then prove that you know you've you are meeting the GSPRs and uh, you've got a good benefit risk ratios and you know stuff like that so I guess these are these are the um, similarities and uh, differences between between the two. Thank you so much for that. Uh, next question is, what is the frequency to update or produce a performance evaluation report? PER frequency, so that is um, risk classification based. Um, for your class Cs and your class Ds of an IVD, um, that is annually, so every year. And for your class A's and your class B's, um, it's you can do that every two years or as and when you're notified by the uh, re uh, request for one or the competent authority request for one. But um, in general, it's two years for class A and B and um, every year for class C's and D's. Thank you for that. Um, again, I, our colleague Dylan Mulvihill has put a link in the chat as well. We're getting to as many questions as we can and we've also uh, recorded this. So if anybody needs to jump off, just know you will get these full details. Uh, Joseph, last question I have here for you. Is a PER required for a scientific opinion by the expert panel of a high risk IVD device? Okay, so um, in the IVDR, um, it is it is stated for your high risk um, IVDs or class Ds, and I think the equivalent for a medical device, uh, you need to seek scientific opinion. Um, so this will be the manufacturer uh, submitting their documentation to the notified body, and the notified body is the one that will seek that scientific opinion um, from the expert panel. Um, on the PER. So I guess this is stated in article, I think it's 48 of the IVDR, which then refers you to article 106 of the, of the MDR. And um, yes, basically for your scientific opinion, yes, you will need your PER. Um, so your PER amongst your technical documentation is what the notified body will submit to the um, expert panel. Um, to get the um, scientific opinion um, on. Um, so yes, you will definitely need your uh, PR for your scientific opinion. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, I know we're a little bit over time. Uh, Joseph, any uh, closing remarks before I sign us off for the day? Thank you again for that excellent presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. I just want to thank everybody that um, joined the webinar and, um, you know, look out for the next one. So uh, check out our website for more, more materials and um, please reach out if you do need any assistance.
Thank you. Absolutely. No, thank you so much. Again, Joseph Richardson Larby, the regulatory affairs expert for medical devices at Celligence. Uh, Joseph, always a pleasure working with you. Um, looking forward to working with Same the Celligence here. team more in 2022. Excited to see what is to come with some of these uh, regulatory developments. And as always, we truly appreciate your detailed insight in walking us through all of that. Uh, so thank you so much again to the Celligence team. Um, and a big thank you to all of our attendees for investing your time with us today. We do hope that you found the course informative. Any further questions or comments for the Celligence team, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at webinars at q1productions.com. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day and be safe and be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.